right, Colossians 3, grab your Bibles, turn to Colossians 3. Please stay standing and then I'll seat you. We didn't begin our service the right normal, so we'll, we'll just stay standing to honor God's Word in Colossians 3. This will be our passage as we've worked our way verse by verse through this amazing epistle. God breathed out through the Apostle Paul to the Colossians. Is this on? It is? Good. I want to go back and pick up context. It's been a few weeks, and so let's, let's begin our reading at verse 12, Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on then as God's elect, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering, or patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everyone together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, into which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And now we launch into... The verse and the passage that we will emphasize for the next few weeks. Paul now fleshes this out even further, right? Doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. In verse 18, he says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. That will be our emphasis today, but let me go ahead and finish the husbands and children. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children unless they become discouraged. These are the words of God. Be seated, please. If we in the local church do not return to God's design, for family, almost nothing else we do will matter much. I want to say that again because I believe it. If we in the church do not return to God's design for home, family, then almost nothing else we do will have much impact or matter much. That's what I said about nine or so years ago when interviewing for this position with the search committee here. When they asked me my philosophy of family ministry, I had a three-page document that summarized my philosophy of family ministry. If you want to see that, just email me and I'll shoot it to you. But I summarized it with that statement. If we don't get back to doing home God's way, not much else will matter. That's because the family is the foundation of all society. Even non-Christians would agree with that. By and large, all human flourishing rests upon a home rightly ordered. A church is only as strong as its families. Listen to me. An unbiblical, a church full of unbiblical, unhealthy homes cannot be a biblically healthy church. It cannot be. It's impossible. To have a biblically healthy church, you must have biblically healthy Homes. Satan seems to understand this maybe better than we do. Where has he leveled his attacks? In our nation and in our world. Destroying the home the way God has designed it. Paul told the church at Corinth, we're not ignorant of the devil's schemes, but I wonder, even in evangelical circles, if we haven't become a little ignorant, given the dearth, uh, the lack of of intentional discipleship, marriage and parenting and home God's way. 
and children. I wonder if Satan's not outsmarted us. I want you to know right up front as, as I begin to introduce this household code, as it's called, that Paul gives us, that we are introducing a new family coaching ministry here at Cordon Baptist Church. It's been on my heart for years. And so we are offering it to you now formally. We have four couples who have agreed to be your mentor, be a coach, a mentor for all things family and home if you need it. Many, many times, uh, guests and members of the church, they don't want to come to a pastor. They, don't want, they may not even need formal biblical counseling, but they do need some coaching. They need some mentoring. They need to learn how to, how to do home God's way. And you'll be more apt, I have found, to, to go to one of your own, just members of the church uh, who, have, who have given themselves to this task. And so I want those four couples to stand, and I'll introduce them to you. And I want you right away today, if you want to start being coached by one of these couples, I don't want you to, de- to delay. Just, just come, come to one of them and ask. So Rick and Debbie Griffin, Tara and Paul is at home, being tested tomorrow. Tara's recovered, praise God. Paul and Tara Stakowitz, Daniel and Haley Neeld, and the Tuckers. They're not standing, but I saw one of them, Chris, and Chris is our watchman today, keeping us, keeping us safe today. Good. Chris and Amanda Tucker. So they're available to you. You all can be seated. Um, and we hope that you will, you'll, get, you'll get the coaching and the mentoring um, if you need it. All you got to do is swallow a little pride. That's all it takes. And say, you know what? I'm not perfect at this. I might need a little help. So we do want to be very intentional in this church. I could overwhelm you with statistics today. I'm not going to. You're as aware of them as I am. Fatherlessness, absentee fathers, no-fault divorce, abortion on demand, so-called gay marriage, the LGBTQ agenda, rampant child abuse, and a rape culture. And some of you now assume I am speaking about the culture outside these walls, outside the church. I am sad to tell you I am talking about the church, inside the church. Not only have all of these things infected and impacted us inside the church. We now have whole denominations and churches embracing much of this godless garbage. Embracing it. You're not mishearing me. Even evangelical churches are embracing some of this godlessness. Even Southern Baptist churches have bought into a lot of foolishness that's not according to to Christ and the Word of God. It was, after all, our own convention, our Southern Baptist Convention, that has produced Beth Moore, a sister who brags repeatedly now about her preaching from pulpits every Sunday all across the Southern Baptist Convention. And very few Southern Baptist leaders seem to have the gospel guts and the spiritual spine to publicly rebuke her. I'm not saying she's not a sister in Christ, but I'm saying we rebuke her and her ideology, her evangelical feminism. She and others like Jen Hatmaker are now lock, stock, and barrel giving themselves to what is called evangelical feminism. Egalitarianism is the other view where egalitarianism basically says, hey, in Christ there are no more uh, functions and roles and relationships. Women can do anything, any function, any role. Men can do anything, any function, any role. There are no limits, no boundaries. And they would quote something like Colossians 3, verse 11. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. But we would say if Paul meant that that erases the roles of a woman and a man in the home, then it's odd that he, in verse 18, says, Wives, submit to your husbands. Christ is our ultimate identity. Identity. He trumps all other identities, but he does not erase function and role in relationships. There's an order that God has established for the creation and for government and for the church and for the home. And to usurp the God-given order is destroying us from within, church. It's destroying us from within. Evangelical feminism, that, that sounds good. You put, see how witty the enemy is? If you put evangelical in front of something, well, that's an easier sell to all of us evangelicals, isn't it? But it's feminism, none the same. My oldest daughter, Megan, years ago, we went to a conference at Southern Seminary together, and we sat in a, 
a really amazing breakout session led by Courtney Reisig. She's a pastor's wife. He pastors in Arkansas, and she blogs and writes, written books on feminism and the history of the movement called feminism. And she says that the feminist movement is now in its fourth wave, or its fourth installment. What started out as a simple women's suffrage movement, I'll have you know, is now a women's superiority movement. There is no denying it if you just keep your eyes open what's happening in our culture. It is an anti-man movement. All masculinity is toxic. The whole world should become feminine. Ironically, this movement is backfiring upon itself. It has now produced the most violent generation of women that I believe the world has ever seen in our own culture in America. And we are putting our women on the front lines of combat to fight our nation's wars. That, that would get a nation mocked and it would be assumed that that nation was under the curse of God in the Old Testament to do such a thing. Because it subverts the created order of God. That men are the protectors and providers. We also have women's MMA, mixed martial arts, where women get into cages and beat one another bloody. We celebrate that. Our culture loves violent women. We celebrate it. You heard God say when we recited from the book of 1 Peter, right? What's beautiful to God? The quiet submissive spirit and that's all but gone in our culture and sadly feminism has influenced every one of us in the church so if you think here like oh we're a healthy church pastor i don't know we're committed to the scripture and i don't think we're that influenced by feminism at the risk of starting a fire perhaps It's not my intent. I just want to be truthful and help you see that we all are actually influenced, even in conservative Bible-believing churches. Let me me foist two things upon you and ask you to think about it. Uh, You sisters in Christ, you wives, I want you to erase the 21st century American mindset as best you can. I want you to know I support your right to vote. I want to preface what I'm about to say with that. But what if you were back in the day and the way the political atmosphere worked is the husband as the head of the house went and cast the vote on behalf of the home. That he was the representative of the home. That's what it means to be the head of something. He's authorized to speak for the home, to stand for the home. Would you have been riled up and angry about that? I'm just asking. I also think maybe we should talk about facial hair. Not facial hair on women. (laughs) No, no, it's facial hair on, on men, perhaps. I know it seems trite, but I want you to imagine if the situation that I have frankly heard and seen in this church were reversed, and I, I were hearing husbands routinely say things about certain parts of their wives' bodies, saying they did not like that, telling other men, I wish that she would change that part of her body. You see how if you reverse that? We, we have all bought into some feminism. I remember when I started growing my beard, um, probably 12, 13 years ago, Oh, I got the craziest questions from, not this church, it was in North Carolina, but are you okay? Uh, people who grow beards have, they say maybe have mental problems. Is your marriage all right? Uh, I've heard that people who grow beards, like it could be marriage strife. And does, what's your wife say about your beard? What's she think about your beard? Uh, and I just, I knew from the start, she doesn't prefer it. She'll tell you right now, she doesn't prefer it. I'll be honest with you. The only reason I prefer it, I kept saying, no, no, no. I've shaved so much in the Marine Corps and and my my face started breaking out in painful sores and I just learned that if I don't shave that much, that doesn't happen. Believe me, I can look in the mirror and tell you my beard's not attractive. I'm not blind, people. I don't really like it that much myself, but I prefer it to open wounds. (laughs) It really was that simple. My wife will love me in spite of me. 
I promise that's what she's done for decades. So I'm not saying you should never respect your wife's wishes or preferences. We'll get to that next week. Man, you come back, it'll be your turn. But right now, I'm just trying to help you see, sisters, we got to be careful. This feminism is insidious. It sneaks in, and it can turn what God has said on its head. But God has a word for you today. Sisters, brothers, men, women, boys, and girls, do you want to hear from God? That's why you're here. That's why you came. God has a definitive word. This passage that begins in verse 18 of chapter 3 and goes through verse 1 of chapter 4 is what's called a household code. We're going to walk through it in the weeks ahead. And I want you to know that the timeless truth, the big idea of the passage, is this. Living for the glory of the Lord Jesus begins at home. Right after Paul has said, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, he breaks down into the home. Living for the glory of the Lord Jesus, it always begins at home. Let me give you the view from 30,000 feet, and then we'll get boots on the ground in verse 18 and walk phrase by phrase through the verse. But it's been a few weeks, so I don't want you to lose, church, the big picture in the context here. It's why I began at verse 12 when I recited the passage to you. Paul has been painting an amazing picture of the supreme sufficiency of Jesus Christ in this epistle, has he not? That has been his theme. Jesus is Lord, period. Lord of all. Supreme, sufficient, preeminent. He's Lord in all things. Lord of creation. Lord of salvation. Lord of sanctification. Lord of glorification. And this whole letter has magnified the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man. And then in chapter 3, Paul starts to drill down. And he teaches us, verse 17, I believe, is the climax of the letter. It's been climbing to this summit where verse 17, it says, Do everything, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Reaches back and summarizes everything that's come before it. And it pushes us forward into the more pointed application of the home. So it reaches back and reminds us, particularly in chapter 3, that we are to live out our entire existence with Jesus Christ on our minds. That's verse 1 and 2 of chapter 3. With Christ in our hearts, verses 5 through 8. With Christ on our lips, verse 9, verse 16. We put on Christ's character as our outer garment, verse 12. We make Christ's forgiveness and patience our very own priority in our human relationships in the church and in the home, verse 13. His love is our trumpet blast theme, verse 14. The peace of Christ is to rule and arbitrate in our hearts, in the church and in the home. And the word of Christ is our teacher, verse 16. And therefore we do everything. We live our whole lives for his glory. It's our greatest treasure, verse 17. Got the big picture? All right, let's bring it home, literally. Wives, submit to your own husbands. As is fitting in the Lord, husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. And then he addresses children and dads, parents. This is a household code. So I want to tell you about household codes under Jesus' lordship. Then I want to tell you about a wife's submission under Jesus' lordship. And then we'll tie a bow around it today. Household codes under Jesus' lordship. Household codes were actually pretty common, pretty normal in the ancient Greco-Roman culture. And Josephus actually laid out such a code in, for Jews in the first century. But the household codes given in the New Testament by God through the writers, I want you to know, church, they are radically different than the culture's household codes of both Jewish Josephuses and of the Greco-Roman versions. I want to briefly summarize four ways that God's household codes contrast sharply with the Greco-Roman, the culture's household codes. Number one, women were rarely, if ever, directly addressed, and they would have never been addressed first. Never. 
We, we know of none that ever did that. They were rarely ever even mentioned in the Greco-Roman household codes, much less to call them out first. Don't you buy the lie, sister, that God is anti-woman. Paul, with his subtle, he's just kind of subtly or maybe not so subtle by addressing the sisters in the church first, the women, the wives, he is already turning his culture's view of house on its head. I'll have you know, women and women-to-be, God loves you, He's paying attention to you, and He speaks directly to you. What a grace. What a kindness. What nurture and tender care He has for you. To care so much for you to know, oh, you're not second class. I want to speak to you first. It shows your importance in the home, doesn't it? You've heard we say it even today, man. Mom, mom however that attitude is with mom, that's, that's setting the, the, the stage for the house that day, isn't it? And so God honors women right off the bat. Paul honors women. Number two, a husband's absolute authority and his natural superiority over women was always assumed in Greco-Roman household codes. His absolute authority and his... Natural superiority were assumed in the world's household codes. Aristotle said it like this, the man of the house is the only one in the house with a rational soul. How's that make you feel, women? God is saying right off the bat in verse 18, it is not so. You are elect, holy, and beloved, and I command and empower you just like I do your husband's. To live for Christ in everything. That's number two. Radical ways, they're different. Number three, I'll be very brief here. Children were seen as, uh, by the Greeks as little more than slaves. We'll get to that. Number four, slaves were seen as the property of the undisputed Lord of the household. Now, do you see how radically different Paul's code is? If you keep reading in verse 22 and 23, he talks about bond servants, slaves. And uh, the, again, this is household stuff. We'll get to this. We don't think of slavery that way in America, but it was household code, that a master of the house and his servants. But he, he just peppers it with work for the Lord. Whatever your position in life, you answer to the Lord, the Lord Christ. Remember, we're doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. He's already told you who the Lord is he has in mind. And then in verse 1 of chapter 4, Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a Lord, a master in heaven. You see what Paul does? He puts everybody in the house under the lordship of Jesus. The man's not the Lord, capital L, of the home. And he better know it. Everyone in the house better know it. Jesus is the Lord of the home. I tell you, the biblical home is radically subversive to secular godless cultures. Listen, women. You want to change your culture here in America? Anybody interested in that? Start at home. Start at home. Start at home. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Radically subversive. Culture, Satan, sin, flesh. We, we hate this stuff. Jesus loves it and His people love it. This is how a culture gets changed. Beginning in the home. With a wife's Submission under Jesus' lordship. So let's peel the onion again. Household code under Jesus' lordship. Now wives' submission under Jesus' lordship. I wonder what the Greek word submit means. Drum roll. It means submit. Submit. No, no matter what the egalitarians and the evangelical feminists tell you, you cannot make this word mean what it does not mean. It means to place oneself under, to subordinate oneself to an authority. Some modern translations that are more concerned about being woke than being accurate have tried to soften the blow here. So the CEV says, quote, Wives must put their husbands first. 
This is what happens when you play games with the word of the living God. That's precisely not what Paul says. Paul would shiver in his liver to see that his word that God breathed out was translated that way. That's precisely not what he teaches. He would have you know, wives, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. You'll never get submission to your husband, right, if you don't first submit to Jesus as Lord of your life, of your home, of everything. You do not put your husbands first. That won't work. It won't work well in a Christian home. It will disorder your home to put your wife first. Put Jesus first. Right? Paul did not say do everything you do in the name of your wife or your husband. He said do everything you do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, what about the message? <laughs> the message translation, I use the word translation loosely, says this. Wives, understand and support your husbands. Well, now Peter, the apostle, is shivering in his liver because we recited what Peter said, what God said through Peter. It's precisely the opposite. Peter says the husband's the one who's supposed to live in an understanding and supportive way of the wife. Don't play games with God's word. What God means, he means. And it's good for us. It's best for us. He's our creator. He's our recreator in Christ. Amen? Submit yourselves. The Greek command is a middle voice command. And so it would literally be submit yourselves, wives. That's important. You see what's being highlighted? The voluntary nature of the submission. God does not say, husbands, submit your wives. God does not say, husbands, submit your wives. No, he addresses the wife as one who is elect, holy, and beloved, empowered by the word and the spirit. Submit yourselves under my lordship to his headship, to his leadership. It's the wives that are being addressed as well. In the Greek, it's the wives... Submit to the husbands. That's important. You see, Paul has a certain population of wives he's addressing here with this command from God Almighty. It won't do you any good to go preach this sermon outside these walls to a, to a lost culture and lost world. You need to just preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. They will hate this until they get saved. He's talking about the wives in Christ, in the church. The wives in the churches of Colossae, whom he has already said have been transferred by the, the beloved Father from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved Son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. He's addressing wives who will be presented by Christ to himself, holy and blameless and above reproach on judgment day. He's talking to wives in chapter 2 who have been circumcised in Christ, baptized in Christ, made alive in Christ. That's the wives he's talking to. So don't tell me, uh, we can't do this in the church. If you're in Christ, you can. Christ in you can. And he will. He's your Lord. He's your power. To willingly, joyfully place yourself under your husband's authority. And then Paul tells us about the manner of the submission and the limits of the submission. As is fitting in the Lord. Well, some of you women should be going, thank God he added that phrase. You see, your submission is not absolute and total to your husband. Not in any shape, form, or fashion. If your husband, God forbid, this should be almost unheard of in a Christian church. And if men do it, they ought to repent quickly. If they're in Christ, they will repent quickly. But if your husband asks you to do something that would dishonor Christ as Lord that would go against his, his explicit commands and his word, then your allegiance is to Christ first. He's the Lord. So as is fitting, as is proper to bring Jesus glory, it limits it and it shows the manner in which you do it. The way you submit matters, right? You don't want to be the kid in the class who's told to quit talking, quit passing notes. Quit talking, quit passing notes. With the third morning, uh, the teacher makes him stand in the corner. That didn't work, so then she makes him sit in the corner. And then he seems to have calmed down after 10, 15 minutes. Then the teacher goes to little Johnny and says, Johnny, uh, are, are, you, are you done with your rebellion now? 
Are you finished with your bad attitude to my authority? And he says, no, teacher, I'm standing on the inside. Now, you can make a kid sit down, but the heart, that's God's work. And so wives in Christ, the way you submit is as is proper, fitting to bring Christ glory. So I do it knowing he's Lord. He knows what's best. This is an act of worship for him. The way you primarily show off and submit to Christ as wives is by your godly submission to your husband. Now there's a parallel passage we need to go to, and I'll be brief. I won't preach this passage, I promise, but we need to go to Ephesians. It's going to instruct us and add some meat to the bones for us. Ephesians chapter 5, just turn back a few, few books. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So the wife's submission here is to be threefold. It's as unto the Lord. Again, you women should be going, thank you God. As unto the Lord. What would honor and please Him. To make sure He's Lord. Lord of Lords. Number two, the wife's submission is as unto the head who sacrifices himself for her. That's important, isn't it? That's kind of pushing us into the men next week. Then number three, in this parallel passage in Ephesians, we learn that a wife's submission is a reflection of the church's submission to Christ. What a high calling. What a high honor that you would be the mirror image of how the church relates to Christ. In your home, that's what Jesus, the Lord, is calling you to. Well, what a great privilege. Why would you shirk such an honor from your Redeemer, who bled out on the tree for you to reflect who he is. Women, I want you not to buy the lie that submission shows inferiority. Don't buy the lie that submission means inferiority. I ask you, is Jesus inferior to anyone, anywhere, at any time? You better answer no, church, and you better do it a little more enthusiastically than that. Is Jesus inferior to anyone, anywhere, at any time? He's Lord. That's what this epistle has been shouting at us. He's Lord. But he submits to the Father in his incarnation every moment. So far that he says, I only say what the Father tells me to say. I only do what the Father tells me to do. Is the Holy Spirit of God inferior To anyone, anywhere, at any time. That was a little more enthusiastic. Some of you are, it's warm in here. I'm dressed too warmly. Wake up! The Holy Spirit of God is God. And yet we're told He submits to exalt only Christ all the time. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 says, The head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. So husbands and wives are being called to reflect your triune God. Their submission in the Godhead. It's a satanic lie to convince you otherwise. Now I hope by now you precious wives are crying out. Oh pastor, I don't know if I'm up to this. I don't feel like I can some days. Most days. I mean, after all, have you seen my husband? He's, he's very flawed. He's very fallible. He's stubborn as a mule. He's hairy like one. And some days he smells like one. You want me to submit to this thing, this guy? And I would say, I, yeah, I've seen your husbands and I'm one of them too. Yeah, that's right. That's why Christ gets all the glory. Nobody in the flesh would care to do such a thing. 
That's why you mirror and magnify the submission of Jesus Christ in your own submission to your husbands. Don't disconnect the, the command of verse 18, precious sisters in Christ. Don't disconnect it from all that's come before it. This is how you put to death what is earthly in you. This is how by the power of God in you, by the Spirit and the Word, you put on compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness, and patience. This is how you magnify bearing with one another. Woo, it starts in the home, doesn't it, sisters? Amen. This is how you forgive, just as the Lord has forgiven you. If it doesn't start in the home, where will it? Where will it ever surface? This is how you put on love above all these things. A love that's like Christ's love. It loves the unlovable. It justifies the unjust. You're magnifying God. This is how the peace of Christ rules in your hearts and the word of Christ instructs and teaches you and dwells in you richly. This is how, wives, you do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father who made you your husband's wife. It is not an accident. He chose you of all the women on the earth to be the wife to your husband. You and you alone. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. The cry of the Christian wife is, lead on, husband. Lead on. Run after Jesus, husband. Run after Him hard. And I'll run after Him too by running after you. Now come back next week and we'll... We'll speak to that, where husbands need to live by the grace of God in such a way that we could say, run after me as I run after Christ. I don't think the subversive beauty of a submissive wife in Christ has a rival. I don't think it can be equal. I see it in this church. I see healthy submission. Not perfect, but consistent, healthy I, I, I don't, I, I'm not here to beat wives down today. I see it. And those of you, some of you are struggling with it, but you're struggling honestly before God and getting counsel and getting mentorship and coaching. And I hope you'll get more of that. Praise God. I see it and I tell you, it's beautiful. The, the women in this church are the most gorgeous women on the planet. And I mean that in a pure way because you're beautiful to God with your quiet, submissive spirits. And how could you not be beautiful then to your pastor? It's not been equal. The, the curse is being reversed in you, sisters, when you submit to your hairy, stubborn husbands. Right? Eve, your desire will be for your husband. Genesis 3.16. If you read chapter 4 of Genesis, it's clear that the word desire there means a controlling desire. You will want to control him. It's what sin will do to you. It will make you a feminist. But in Jesus' name, it's being reversed. And I see it happening here. And I celebrate it with you. And I am cheering you on. I will help in any way I can. But come to think of it. The beauty of a quiet, submissive wife does have a rival. It, it does have an equal. It's surpassed only by the horrible, beautiful, submissive Savior bleeding out on the cross. Obedient even to death on the cross. And so may your submission, wives and wives-to-be, mirror His and magnify His because only His submission saves sinners and only His submission Sanctify saints. God help us. I thank you for the godly women you have put in this church. And I pray that those who are struggling will struggle well. In the power of your spirit and your word, they'll struggle with sisters who are coming alongside them. Coaching and mentoring them and helping them and encouraging them. And building them up to do home your way. For your glory, Lord Jesus, help us do it in the name of Jesus with gratitude. 
Amen.